Let's break the political talk show mold. Anything worth doing is hard, and that includes being a good citizen. Our mission is to help you be that better citizen by letting you hear about stuff you might not know, which will make everyone think you're so smart. Or by giving you a chance to listen to interviews and debates on a wide variety of subjects that might actually allow you to form new opinions in the privacy of your own mind. I'm Justin Oldham, and you are listening to the Politics and Patriotism Show here on the Stitcher Smart Radio Network. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to another Civil War edition of the Politics and Patriotism Show. In our last episode, you heard from show contributor Luke Herbert as he was talking to Civil War historian John F. Marzalak, and most of what they talked about related to Ulysses S. Grant. So today I thought we would follow up that episode with a conversation that I recently had with Civil War historian Jack Hurst. His latest book, published in May of 2012, courtesy of Basic Books, is Born to Battle, Grant and Forrest, in Shiloh, Vicksburg, and Chattanooga. Now, these were the only three battles in which Nathan Bedford Forrest and Ulysses S. Grant ever bumped heads with each other without even knowing about it. But the author makes the point that Grant and Forrest are more alike than you would think. Now, Grant gets to be the uh, the continuation thread of this discussion. We know a great deal about Hiram Ulysses Grant, who eventually goes on to become the 18th president of our United States. But even still today, we as a society don't know that much about Nathan Bedford Forrest, other than he's a really scary guy. Once upon a time, he was the head of the KKK, and he was just a really racist jerk. That's most of what we know about him. But he turns out to be a whole lot more. I'm going to let Jack tell you all about this, so grab your popcorn, settle in for a very interesting story, because this sounds like the script for a movie, but it's actual history, and it's a useful thing for us to know it, because I've always said that One person in the right place at the right time can make all the difference. And while Forrest did not help the Confederacy win the Civil War, he also, uh, by the same measure, prevented their defeat at an earlier point in time than they might have otherwise lost. So keep that in mind as you listen to Jack Hurst talk about Born to Battle. Jack Hurst, welcome to the Politics and Patriotism Show. I'm really happy to meet you. Well, thank you very much, and right back at you. Okay, let's get right down to brass tacks here. I'm curious to know what motivated you to write Born to Battle, because I looked up your bibliography, and this is not the first time that you've written about uh, uh, Ulysses S. Grant and Nathan Bedford Forrest. So what what's the backstory behind this? Well, the backstory is it was all a, a, a an accident. <laughs> and I, you know, in in writing the previous book, Men of Thought, uh, I set out to write a book about uh, the Battle of Fort Donelson, and uh, so uh, I, as I was writing that, uh, I came realizing that uh, a lot of, you know publishers in New York uh, would probably never have heard of the Battle of Fort Donaldson, and uh, so I had to find some way to sell it, and, and about halfway through the writing of it, I suddenly realized that I had two of the greatest names in the Civil War on the same battlefield there, and so then I began to highlight Grant and Forrest in that book, and that just led me then to, after the Battle of Fort Donaldson, to look at, at, at them as both of them uh, were basically uh, antagonists uh, until Grant finally, uh, you know, won at Chattanooga and was called east to face Lee. But before that, Forrest was always there 
one way or another, you know, trying to hamper the union effort, which Grant was the head of. Your comparison of these two men is very enlightening to me, and so I encourage our listeners to pick up Born to Battle, which is Grant and Forrest, Shiloh, Vicksburg, and Chattanooga. This book was published in May of this year, 2012, courtesy of Basic Books. And as I uh, went through all 512 pages of this thing, I was amazed at how quickly you were able to move through the subject matter with documentation. And then I, when, I, when I found out more about your journalistic background, I see how this was possible. And I myself am a writer, and I, I can say, uh, for the sake of our audience here, that you don't write like a university professor. There's definitely some of your journalistic background that shows through here in the way this thing moves. It, it really is quite a fast read for, for something of such major size. But I don't want to scare anybody off, so let's, uh, let, let's uh, try to give them some incentive to read this book. Now, I don't want to um, steal your thunder, so tell us about what was so similar about Grant and Forrest that makes this book so important. Well, Grant and Forrest really were, were more like each other, even though they were on opposite sides. They were more like each other than they were like uh, their peers and superiors in the hierarchies of either army. Uh, they were, uh, it, and that just occurred to me as I was writing this book. It, it just, they, more and more, they, they were like each other. Whereas, uh, and, and I, as, I, as I reflected on that and reflected on why, it suddenly occurred to me that both of them were from well beneath the upper level of society, both of them. And, and, uh, and it, it began, it seemed to me that there had to be a correlation between the fact that they were the only two who were from that level. They were both looked down on because they were from that level. And and yet they were the two most successful uh, generals in the Western theater, you know, on on the two sides. And and uh, and and it seemed to me that there there had to be a correlation between that. And 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 then I began to look at at uh, you know why that might have been. And their 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 previous lives, you know, before the war, early on, Forrest's life was extremely hard scrabble. And Grant's was pretty much the same way. I mean, Forrest was the uh, son of a blacksmith who who died when Forrest before Forrest reached the age of 16. And by that time, his father had lost the family farm in Middle Tennessee and had had to move the family onto a leased hill farm in North Mississippi. Uh, Grant was the son of of a uh, of a man who made his his living in the business of tanning animal hides you know which was not exactly a pleasant business and and in fact grant hated the tanning shed so bad that he he uh he from early from boyhood he he supplemented the family income working with horses and mules and he was a genius with with horses and mules and uh and then uh Forrest gradually just by furious labor made himself a a a, a self proclaimed millionaire before the war uh you know trading land and mostly by buying and selling slaves uh, grant by contrast uh just a couple well three or four years before the war was in such bad financial shape that he was on street corners in St. Louis. Old army buddies had seen him on street corners in St. Louis in shabby clothes, uh, you know, peddling firewood to try to keep his family fed. So these men, both of them, had had lived with their backs to the wall, and they had calluses on their hands from from doing physical labor themselves. And, and you know, the upper crust people of that time didn't... Uh, you know, just look down on people who who had to do that kind of work. But what this is really, it, it, to me, it, it was just the the quintessential American story. I mean, it's 
it's it's what America sort of stands for, and it, it's its image to to people has become that you know this place where people from the bottom can rise to the top, and and that an awful lot of the best stuff that is done in America is done by people who have done that. Well, poor boy makes good is definitely both myth and reality in American society. And while we know so much these days about Grant, I learned more about Nathan Bedford Forrest in this book than I had known previously. And I've lived in both the North and the South, and for the most part, Forrest, aside, I mean, Forrest was a hard man. That is just the fact of the matter. And That's right. He uh, <laughs> he still to this day has a very scary reputation, but what you show us in this book is uh, a very accompli- He's he's a very accomplished horse handler. He's a very mm-hmm. skilled logistician. He. He looks out for his troops in ways that are very compassionate. So you've really succeeded in humanizing him here. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, you know, uh, Forrest was was a man who, who although he had almost no formal education, uh, he was a man who thought a lot, and he thought a lot about the things that he wanted to do. Uh, you know, when it came to fighting, he was he was a a, a real philo- philosopher uh, about how you how you went about it, and uh, but the same thing was true of everything he tried to do before the war too. I mean, he just he was a person who, from boyhood, you know, this harder life that I spoke of uh, had had trained him to, you know, you did not go to the field before without having every tool you were going to need that day because you didn't want to waste one minute of daylight because he was trying to get ahead you know he it was just a furious uh climb to the top and that's and and so much of the uh, of the uh, his performance in the civil war uh you can look back on on this previous uh education that he had gotten in the fields uh to you know, it explains why he he was the way he was in the war, and also, you know, he he was a he had been a member of the Memphis City Council, and so he knew a lot of um, he he knew a lot of uh, the ways you got things done uh, that way too. So he he was he he was a pretty well-rounded person by the time he he got into the. The Civil War. Now, when both of these men do get into the Civil War, they have a great deal of appreciation for what they have. To borrow an old school term, they know how to make do, and that steads them very well. Even though Grant seems to be up to his ears in supplies from time to time, and Forrest does not, they are both constantly having to make do with whatever they have on the spot, and if they're there is one great commonality that they have, which vexes both of them. It's the fact that they're they're plagued by their superiors in ways that civilians are going to find hard to understand. But I've been around the military my whole life, so I could I I could feel for both of these men. But I'd like you to take a few minutes, if you would, and explain the West Point prejudice and the difference between the Union Army prejudices and the Confederate military prejudices that these men had to deal with. Well, uh, you know, the, what you were talking about a minute ago about their, uh, you know, the way they uh, made do with what they had, I mean, that was something that had been ingrained in them from their earlier life. I mean, that's just what you had to do if you if you were born on their level uh, in those days. And, and so, you know, whereas most of their uh, upper crust superiors and peers, and almost uh, almost all of them were upper crust, uh, especially in the first two years of the war. I mean, these people were used to having everything, and so they didn't want to move unless they had everything. And and Grant and Forrest knew. That, I mean, from from they, they had understood from their you know in their bones from their earlier training that what you had to do was. You had to take advantage of every opportunity that that came, and that 
there was never going to be a perfect time when you had everything. I mean, you, you were just going to, you know, uh, I think Abraham Lincoln, uh, when, when uh, you know, he was told by one of his generals that, uh, uh, that he, you know, that his troops were all green and, 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 uh, Lincoln said, well, you know, they're all green on the other side too. You know, you're both green together. Uh, so go do it. That's what he basically was saying. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, Southern, uh, army, uh, was almost entirely West Point. And of course they had a West Point president in West, in, in Jefferson Davis, uh, and 22 of the 25 men who who made the rank of of either lieutenant general or full general in the in the Confederate Army during the Civil War, uh, 22 of them were West Pointers, and and of the other three, one was Richard Taylor, who was the son of a U.S. president, uh, Zachary Taylor, and and uh, and then Wade Hampton was reputed to be the largest landholder in the South. And then the third one was this, you know, this forest. All these other people were, were, you know, extremely cultivated men and, and well educated and 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 everything else. And 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 then you had Forrest, who basically uh, had, had had had, you know, in his early life been basically a glorified uh, tenant farmer. So, um, you know, the, the 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 contrast between him and his his uh, uh, peers was was just uh, you know it was a gulf and 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 it was pretty much the same way for Grant uh, because Grant's uh, you know his uh, one of his peers John Pope was a a uh, relative of Mary Todd Lincoln uh, two of his his subordinates were uh, had been members of Congress at the outset of the war. One of them was the uh, son of a governor of Indiana, and then his his boss Henry Halleck uh, was this lion of West Point, uh, who had written nationally recognized books uh, on uh, war and also on law, and had made himself rich in uh, the California territory before the war. And then the general in chief of the army in, early in the war was. George McClellan, who was a member of an old and wealthy Philadelphia family, and was also, uh, it, although he was still very young, he was one of the leading railroad executives in the United States at the outset of the war. So, uh, you know, and then you've got Grant, the Tanner's son, who who had a reputation in the in the old army of of being a drunk and. Uh, so, you know, when he came back into the army and he barely made it back into the into the Union Army when the when the war began, uh, he still, you know, that the whispers of alcoholism were all around him. And so, uh, you know, I think that that uh, he he was um, th- that that uh, uh, brand was put on him because he was lower class. I really think that because, uh, uh, you know, that he didn't drink as much as as many of his his uh, superiors and peers did, uh, and he never drank anywhere near a battlefield. I mean, you know, he wasn't going to ruin his enjoyment of the fight. Uh, he 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 only drank when he got just so restless and he had nothing to do. And uh, I mean, that seemed that from from most evidence, that's that's the kind of drinker he was he'd go off on uh, i think uh he he even called him sprees uh uh once in a while but he he was not uh you know your your textbook daily drinker you know this program is brought to you by shadowfusionbooks.com When I am around uh, military people, just being the civilian that I am, I see a lot of these prejudices that that you talk about 
And my my father was a 21 year veteran of the United States Army. Flew helicopters for for three tours in Vietnam. And he, wow. he, he even he still to this day he jokes that the, the that the West Point ring enters the room before the graduate himself. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh huh. So that 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 is uh, that that's still with us. But I'd like you to expand a little bit on the aristocratic nature of the Confederate chain of command. And I'll, I'll, there is one thing I want to say about this right now. Uh, your you you hung a label on Braxton Bragg in this book that made me laugh for at least ten minutes. You called him an adjunct aristocrat, and I really would like you to expand on that. Well. Uh, he was uh, Bragg was born uh, in uh, in uh, eastern North Carolina. To uh, 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 his father was a carpenter, uh, but his father was a very successful carpenter, and so that by the time Bragg, who was one of his younger sons, came along, the father was able to send him to a you know a, a, a fine boys' school, and and then uh, and from that he went on to West Point and. And then, uh, you know, uh, he took he he parlayed his his Mexican War heroism and advertised heroism into uh, 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 a, a marriage with a very rich uh, lady in South Carolina. Who, I mean, in uh, Louisiana, who had uh, uh, many uh, uh, she had a, a huge uh, sugar plantation, and so uh, that's that's basically what he. You know that's that's how he entered the aristocracy, and he and he really uh, felt himself to be a member of it too. I mean, you know, he he took to it well. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're being unduly modest because time and time again, you make the point in this book that General Bragg goes out of his way to slight Forrest at absolutely every single turn. Although, I, I gotta say, I think the single best thing that Braxton Bragg ever did for Nathan Bedford Forrest is to tell him to go forage, because once Forrest begins to take and use, he does quite well for himself. Yes, right, right. Well, whenever Forrest could operate, you know, pretty much on his own, he was he was just a, a genius. I mean, he... he when he was hampered by other people around him, he, you know, uh, uh, by superiors who who wanted to dictate one thing or another, he he had, uh, you know, he he had problems. But there's one there's a thing about Forrest that that I think that in in writing this book I I I realized more than I ever had before, and that is, you know, he's got this reputation as as a guy who. Uh, who never followed orders and just basically, you know, went off and did whatever he wanted to, uh, whenever he wanted to, and 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 you know he was uncontrollable and all this, and uh, I I see no evidence in this book. I mean, there's very little evidence that he w- that he did that. I mean, he seems to have followed every order that he got that was of any consequence. Now. There were was a time or two when Bragg tried to, uh, uh, you know, there was one time there just before the end of, you know, uh, when um, Bragg tried to take, uh, tried to dismount uh, some uh, cavalry that had served under John Morgan, and uh, and Forrest, you know, he 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 certainly knew the pride that that cavalrymen had about being cavalrymen. And uh, and he just refused to obey Bragg's order to dismount these 240 men, and uh, he just kept them with him and 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 protected them from Bragg uh, until. Um, but that was near the end of his his stint with Bragg when he finally you know he finally just told Bragg well you know the the story is that he. He just shook his finger in Bragg's face and said that if their paths ever crossed again, it would be at the peril of Bragg's life. Well, while we're still on the subject of uh, Forrest, uh, I learned more about him uh, than I have ever known before, as I've said previously. And 
you touch briefly at the end of the book on the final years of Forrest's life. And this man, even still today, is widely known for his racism. And I noticed that your your comments about his uh, his his final years about making his peace with his uh, with his pending mortality and i there there there's there's a part of me the the lizard part of my brain the snake oilsman the the, the snake oil salesman part of my heritage i'm wondering how much of that was him really changing or how much of that was him adapting to the changing times around him because he was a smart enough guy to know that you bend with the wind and for somebody yeah, that, like that, that was un, that was unlike uh, a lot of his his you know his his uh, fellow uh, high ranked ex confederates too a lot of them didn't uh, didn't uh, you know weren't going to adapt to anything but but he I, I think you're exactly right I think he he was smart enough to know that you adapted to whatever was happening you know around you. Well, I was amazed to find out that he made a speech before members of the Democratic Party. That's a shocker. And I, I, have they gone out of their way to sweep that under the rug since? Because I, I never even heard about that in college. Oh, yeah. He, he was a local Democratic leader you know, in, in, in West Tennessee. He was a, in, in Memphis. He was a, he was a, uh, he, he was a, a, a member of the democratic you know establishment there as as a former you know member of the city council and all that uh, he he was a, sort of a minor uh, political figure in Memphis and and you know and and at that time you know all the uh, the ex confederates were all democrats you know very interesting indeed. Now, because you're in uh, that part of the world, you live in Nashville. What is the the prevailing opinion of Forrest in that part of the world now in 2012? Well, uh, Forrest, I suppose, is is uh, except by people who are you know uh, really into the Civil War. The only thing they know about him is the is the uh, the the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, you know connection i mean as far as i know there is no you know nothing is written down but it's pretty well accepted that he was the the leader of the i mean almost everybody uh you know feels that he was the the leader of the ku klux klan for a couple of years in its in its in its formative time he didn't start it but he uh, but he was its leader for a couple of years but and then as you said he began to you know as he as he was uh, trying to uh, you know build a railroad from Memphis to Selma, Alabama, he uh, he he had to have seen then that 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 was certainly working at cross purposes to his his uh, other enterprises. And then later on, uh, you know, when in 1875, two years before his death, uh, he w- was sick. And uh, he was, you know, he he joined the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, and uh, and then is when he made the made a speech uh, before uh, a it was a it was a, uh, a speech for the Democratic Party to a uh, an African American group, and uh, and you know the things that he said there uh, were very. Uh, powerful things about about the two, you know, races getting together. He said he wanted to see uh, the African Americans, um, you know, get positions in stores and law offices and wherever they were able to go. And uh, you know, that was, I don't, you know, I don't recall Abraham Lincoln ever saying anything like that. And and uh, some people have said, you know, that well, this is just more, you know, <clears throat> wily wizardry. And it may well have been, but uh, I think because of when it occurred, you know, the, about the time that he joined the, the church and that he was, he was, you know, reexamining his own life, when he joined the church, he said, you know, he was the fool who built his house on sand. 
and uh, uh, there was just all this spirit of re-examination in his life. I think that uh, that he was uh, reassessing a lot of his own attitudes. As we are all ultimately want to do as we get older. Yes, so, that's right. That's right. Well, let me, as we wrap up here, uh, I want to ask you, what's not in this book that, in hindsight, you would have you, you would have put in if the opportunity presented itself? Oh, man. Um, I... Uh, hmm. I'm, I'm at a loss. I don't. I don't know exactly what else. The only thing that I can say is that I, I you know, that there there is more of the story to go, and I, and I hope to be able to write it. You know, I mean, after Forrest goes, uh, you know, goes after Grant goes east, and and Forrest uh, goes, uh, you know, to the Western Theater and tries to, uh, you know, uh, recoup confederate fortunes uh you know up and down the mississippi river um that you know th- there's that whole story that's still left to be told you know and and uh so i hope i can get to that eventually what is your next writing project or are, are you working on something now i'm just starting to uh, uh to try to do an, another volume of this you know i mean another the, the, a, a, to tell that story that I just said, you know, of the of, the, of what, what Grant faced when he went east, and and what Forrest faced out there, uh, m- operating more or less as a partisan raider out there most of the time. And now that I have read this book. I'm never going to think of the Clint Eastwood film, The Outlaw Josie Wales, in quite the same way ever again. That is, without a doubt, one of my all-time favorite movies. I always had Forrest in the back of my mind when I watched this film. But but, uh, now if I ever see it again, with all of the details that I've learned about that man from this book, I'll certainly uh, watch it in a new and different way. Right. Right. Well, I'll tell you, you know, the thing about uh, the the I think that one of the reasons that Grant and Forrest both uh, were so um, became such powerful figures in the war is is because, you know, war is a nasty business. And, you know, people who have gotten their hands dirty are the people who are probably best equipped to uh, to take it on. And. Uh, those two guys had done that, and they and they turned out to be pretty good at it. In many respects, I'm glad that Forrest did not uh, you know, did did not have a more enlightened chain of command because. Uh, being the northerner that I am, I'm glad that this thing turned out the way it did. But if if, if Forrest, because of be, he was the right guy in the right place at the right time, if he had been given a free hand or more of a free hand than he already had, you know, we we might be uh, <laughs> we might be talking to each other from two different countries today. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, there are people who who argue that Forrest never could have been any more than he was. You know, just a a, a, a peerless raider, but uh, but I think I mean Forrest was uh, such a quick study. I mean he he learned things so fast and he adapted so fast that I think he would have I think he could have been a a, 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 a a very very effective leader of a of of infantry as well as uh, of of cavalry had he ever gotten the chance. Now, my my last question for this interview has to be asked, just because uh, some of my show contributors are military buffs. How does Forrest compare to Stonewall Jackson? Well, I think I think that uh, that I think that that's the that's exactly what Forrest would have. I mean, he would have been much like Stonewall Jackson had he been, uh, uh, you know, allowed to to. Uh, uh, command infantry um i i you know uh he he certainly used artillery uh 
with brilliant effect. And uh, and so uh, I think he would have. I think he would have been about as uh, hard and unbending a leader of of infantry as he was of cavalry. You know, uh, Jackson wasn't exactly a sweetheart when it came to uh, <laughs> to uh, leading his men. You know, <laughs> I remember I remember a quote uh, I saw from a from a guy who had served in under Jackson back when I was a kid, and I've remembered it all my life. Uh, the the guy said. Uh, all old Jackson give us was a gum blanket and 40 rounds, and he drove us like hell. That is quite the philosophy. Now, unfortunately, we've actually driven to the end of our half hour, so I really hope that uh, your your sequel to this takes off, and I would really enjoy being able to read it and then talk to you about it when the time comes. Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate this, and I, I mean, it's an honor to talk to you, and I, and I thank you very much for it. I've left my old father, my country, my home. I've left my old mother to weep and to mourn. I am a rebel soldier and far from my home. Well, as Fern likes to say, that's a wrap. And we have come to the end of another fast half hour. As a matter of fact, we've gone a few minutes over time today because Jack had a lot to say, and I thought this whole thing was very informative. And it just goes to show you that your national history is deeper than you think it is. So no matter what country you live in, I strongly suggest that you get to know your national history and your historical figures. Find out who they were and what they did. What kind of mistakes did they make and what did they actually do right? Because those who do not know their history are doomed to repeat it. So on behalf of everyone here at the Politics and Patriotism Show, thank you.